Okay, great. I'm so delighted to be here with you for this lecture. Tonight I'm going to talk about the impact automation is making on the accessibility of dignified labor, engage with proposals for universal basic income. I'll argue for a retrieval of the expansive understanding of work found in Catholic social thought. And I'll propose that addressing the issues surrounding work in the 21st century requires a broadened vision of merit rooted in Christian theology. Thinking about universal basic income can help us shift our understandings of what it means to earn a living. So we all know that developing new technologies have affected the shape of work for a very long time. A quick trip through history to demonstrate how. Hmm. There we go. So here's the traditional model of work. In home, very small scale, one person doing an entire task from start to finish. In this case, spinning fiber into thread. Here's how that model of work started to change around the time the US was founded. For those of you who've studied some economic history, Adam Smith observed that the division of labor helps workers produce more faster. So here are some workers spinning thread with the division of labor. Instead of one person doing all the tasks, they have one drawing out the string, one turning the wheel, a couple going around and picking up the balls of yarn. So you've got workers producing more faster, and that generates wealth for their employer. So here's something Adam Smith, who died in 1790, wasn't able to see, but Karl Marx around 50 years later described quite clearly. What do business owners do when they make a profit? They take that money and invest it in machines that help do more work faster so they can save money on paying their workers' wages. So here we are in the Industrial Revolution. So look at the volume of thread these two children are generating compared to the painting before. Because they're working with a big machine provided for with worker-generated wealth that takes the place of many workers. And here's a factory today. So again, you can see there's been a quantum leap forward in terms of the volume being created with respect to the number of workers doing the work. So this is a phenomenon first observed by 19th century philosophers, Karl Marx, John Stuart Mill, and others. Workers' efforts help pay for the technology that will eventually put these workers out of jobs. And this is still going on today. So we're probably familiar with this story as it relates to manufacturing jobs. Many of us know that if you go into a factory these days, you'll see way fewer people and much more complex machines than would have been the case in the past. And people who work in factories often need more advanced skills and training because their job is increasingly to manage these complex machines. But what many of us might be less prepared for is that robots are increasingly able to replace human work in many, many fields, not just manufacturing. This is not some kind of sci-fi future, it's already happening. So here's a look at how this process is playing out in recent decades. So these graphics are taken from an interactive map created by NPR's blog, Planet Money, using data from the Department of Labor. Um, it's kind of fun to play around with on your own if you Google NPR Planet Money most common jobs, but I just took stills to show you. So in 1978, the most common job in 19 US states is listed as secretary. That's the baby blue color. Truck driver is teal, machine operator is a sort of dark teal. This would be a lot easier to explain if they'd used a less tasteful color scheme. <laughs> Farmer is green. So that was 1978. In 1994, already we see some big shifts. There are only two states left where machine operator or factory worker is the most common job, down from 10 in 1978. Some of this will be due to offshoring, but 1994 is the year NAFTA took effect, and we can see the decline of manufacturing jobs is already well underway. So in 1994, secretarial work is the most common job in 11 states, down from 19. What machine was working its way into every kind of workplace in the 1990s? It's OK. Yep, computers, thank you. <laughs> Filing, searching for information, managing mail, editing documents, not as many workers were needed to do these types of tasks because machines were helping fewer people do them faster. So in 2014, we can see that the most common job in 29 US states is truck driver. Anything we should be aware of in thinking about that? Are machines, do truck drivers have anything to worry about when it comes to improving technology? Self-driving trucks. Self trucks, yeah. So if you know a truck driver, or if you live in a place where a lot of people are truck drivers, which all of you currently do, uh, big shifts are coming in your experience and their experience uh, with that technology on the horizon. 
And so notice that we're talking about, about a time span of about 40 years here, about the length of an average person's working life. So it's possible that a worker who is unlucky enough to enter several industries affected by automation could be forced with retraining completely three or four times in a working life. Job retraining is often proposed as a solution to mechanization, but when we see how quickly robots are affecting the shape of work, it starts to seem less and less realistic as a long-term solution for many. And let's not forget that machines are increasingly able to do many tasks that we think of as intended for humans with college or even graduate degrees. Robots can write code. Robots can write newspaper articles. They can perform legal discovery and draft legal documents. They can provide psychological and physical therapy. So robot, robots doing human jobs is not just a problem for blue collar workers, and it's not just a futuristic possibility. It's a present reality that affects every one of us. When people today confront the coming impact of automation on jobs, they tend to predict very dire futures, increasing poverty and inequality, even social unrest, as people left with no way to support themselves lash out at those in power. But earlier in economic history, observers of automation predicted a very different future. When political philosophers like John Stuart Mill and John Maynard Keynes realized how much work machines could handle, they predicted societies would figure out how to use machines to help everybody work less. A contemporary proposal called Universal Basic Income, or UBI, attempts to respond to concerns about the impact of technology on human labor. As a theologian, I find UBI especially compelling for two reasons. One, it's a practical, tested proposal that has the opportunity to genuinely promote social equality and human dignity, and theological ethics na naturally wants to support that. And two, engaging with the proposal of UBI forces us to confront some of our deeply held ideas about what work is for, what a human life is for, and earning a living in the most literal sense, our ideas about who deserves to live. In my view, UBI pushes us to develop these ideas in ways that are fully resonant with the Christian tradition, challenging some of the erroneous views we inherit from our own culture. So I'll spend some time discussing basic income as a proposal before I move on to engaging it with theological ethics. At its most simple, universal basic income, UBI, or guaranteed minimum income, proposes that governments provide a cash income to every adult, and some proposals to every child, regardless of income and without means testing. Basic income is usually understood to provide a survival income. It's basic, enough to maintain a floor of subsistence. It's universal, giving it to everyone reduces stigma and eliminates the need for means testing. And importantly, it's unconditional. Unlike many benefits in the US today, with UBI there are no restrictions on other earnings. Whatever you earn on top of your basic income is yours to keep. Basic income is supported by a stunning range of public thinkers past and present. Richard Nixon and Martin Luther King Jr. Progressive, moderates, and conservatives, academic philosophers, political candidates, and Silicon Valley billionaires. In ethics, sometimes we're called to think beyond what might be politically feasible at a certain moment, and we don't apologize for that. But it's still always nice when a particular proposal actually has the potential for bipartisan support. So what, what would basic income look like in the concrete? Some advocates, including Andrew Yang, an entrepreneur running for president on a basic income platform, propose $1,000 a month in the US. Economist Charles Clark created a graduated basic income proposal for Ireland at the request of a Christian organization there. His proposal would offer 110 euros a week, around $130, to adults 18 to 64, about half that to children, and slightly more to older adults. And the Facebook billionaire Chris Hughes proposes providing $500 a month to lower and middle income working Americans. His proposal would include those in school or providing elder care or child care in the home as workers eligible to receive this benefit. So his proposal is a basic income that, however, is not universal. It's true that any one of these proposals would be quite costly, requiring a significant increase in tax revenue, although Clark thought Ireland could pull it off while taxing less than the European Union average. This is why it's quite noteworthy that many new economy billionaires have come out in support of basic income. Tech leaders like Hughes, Elon Musk, and Mark Zuckerberg realize they don't need the vast fortunes our unequal economy has allowed them to accumulate. And they're willing to pay higher taxes to support a proposal that promises stability to so many others. While there's currently no country that guarantees its citizens UBI, that does not mean the proposal has not been tested. In fact, the meaningful real-world successes of UBI are a good reason to be excited about it. 
UBI was pilot tested in states across the US as we came very close to adopting basic income through the 60s and 70s. The pilot test found that UBI successfully reduced poverty with minimal reduction in paid working hours, which were generally replaced with other useful activities such as improving homes or education. More recently, from 1994 to 98, the state of Minnesota pilot tested a version of basic income by combining several poverty aid programs, including food stamps, into one flexible cash benefit, and trying to lessen the poverty trap effect of having benefits decrease as the recipient increased earnings from work. Families enrolled in the pilot program experienced higher rates of employment and income, increased marriage rates, decreased rates of abuse, and better behavior and educational outcomes for school-aged children. And Stockton, California is currently testing basic income, not universal, but provided to some of its poorest families. The experience of Native American tribes who distribute casino income among all members is also often cited as a real-world example of basic income. And these cases similarly dis demonstrate impressive results. For example, before opening a casino and sharing its profits with tribal members, the Eastern Band of Cherokee in North Carolina had high rates of poverty and the many health problems that tend to accompany it. Their unconditional cash payments, now around $12,000 per adult per year, reduced behavioral and emotional problems and addiction among children without reducing participation in the labor force. As you can see, basic income promises many benefits to societies that adopt it. Here are some of the most significant. Basic income reduces stigma. It's no secret that government benefits that everybody receives, like Medicare for the elderly, are widely trusted and beloved, while means-tested benefits like EBT or food stamps in the US come with a hefty dose of social stigma and accompanying psychic distress for those in need. Because it's universal, basic income combats that stigma and conveys another benefit. It reduces administrative costs. Means testing for government benefits means significant costs go to verifying and tracking eligibility, following up with those who are no longer eligible and processing applications from the newly eligible. Today, some think of basic income as a utopian lefty proposal, but an early proponent was one of the 20th century's most famous conservatives, University of Chicago economist Milton Friedman. Friedman proposed basic income through a negative income tax precisely to eliminate costs spent on administration, as well as to give people maximum control over how their benefits are spent. About that, basic income puts people in control. In the US, if your income is low enough, you might be eligible for housing assistance, food assistance, childcare benefit, and perhaps help with fuel in the winter. But you can't spend housing assistance on diapers, and you can't put fuel assistance toward groceries if your EBT runs low. Basic income trusts that people will spend their benefit in the way that makes the most sense for them and their families. So economists who want to avoid market inefficiencies appreciate it for that reason. In most cases, basic income does not reduce participation in work. Now, as we saw, some philosophers have argued that reducing work hours wouldn't be such a bad thing. But in the US, we do tend to be very concerned that people who receive help from society in the form of government assistance should deserve it by working or looking for work. So from that perspective, it's good news that where UBI has been tested, it generally does not reduce work for pay, with two exceptions, students in higher education and mothers of young children. When UBI was pilot tested in the US in the 1970s, a researcher concluded that the laziness contention is just not supported. Universal basic income would particularly help people who are most economically vulnerable, including women and children. Since women, especially women with kids, are disproportionately poor, greater economic freedom could help women escape evils that disproportionately fall on them. Philosopher Jessica Flanagan holds that UBI would do more than almost any other economic policy imaginable to make women less susceptible to abuse both in the workplace and at home. An economic floor beneath their feet would grant many women unprecedented freedom to leave harassing work environments or abusive partners. Basic income will help societies prepare for the automated future of labor. For many UBI proponents, this is a key aspect of their support. Jobs are going away, machines are going to do them, and people will be less and less likely to find paid work as adequate to meet their basic needs. Under current circumstances, like I said, UBI does not seem to reduce wage work for many people, but we may need it to in the future, as machines increasingly do the work humans are doing now. As I mentioned earlier, there's a very real sense in which the new technology that eliminates jobs is funded by the labor of workers whose efforts create profits for their employer. 
If the profits workers generate eventually put them out of work, it seems fundamentally fair and appropriate to tax the recipients of those profits to provide displaced workers with basic income. We can certainly envision a society where machines do a great deal of work, all humans receive a basic income, and the humans spend their time doing whatever else they're able to do. Maybe waged work for some, child care, elder care, for others, art, exercise, community volunteering, or whatever pursuits we'd all have more time for now, if not for all this pesky wage labor we're all doing. Mill and Keynes would likely applaud. Basic income is a pro-family policy, and I know some of us are probably comfortable with the government pursuing practices that support families, and others of us might be made un uncomfortable by the idea. But I found support for UBI among those with very traditional and those with very radical ideas of family structure. Both see that if it provides support for leaving harmful relationships, UBI could also support women and men in forming the types of long-term relationships they desire, including marriage. Some proponents of UBI, like the late Daniel Patrick Moynihan, value it as a potential promoter of marriage and traditional family structures. According to sociologists Catherine Eden and Maria Kafalis, women in poverty can be leery of marriage because they worry that a male partner would become an economic burden instead of a support. Basic income helps address that concern. In a different vein, feminist philosopher Kathy Weeks praises basic income for enabling people to choose alternatives to the dominant ideal of family form. For example, we could envision single moms pooling their basic incomes to live together and raise their children together, even if they are not romantic partners. Whether we're interested in supporting nuclear families, chosen families, or the whole spectrum of ways love and care are shared and homes are forged, Nobody thinks it's good for people to feel forced to stay in families or hindered from creating them because of economic desperation. Basic income helps adequately value care. Many people, again disproportionately women, at times will leave the waged workforce or curtail their waged work hours to give care to family members and others. This does not make them non-contributing citizens. As a society, we desperately need this type of care to take place. Unpaid caregiving work whether it's done full-time or alongside a paid job, contributes considerable value to the formal economy at significant cost to the unpaid caregiver. This point is made in remarkably similar fashion by Catholic feminist theologian Christine Fair Hinsey and Marxist feminist Kathy Weeks. In Hinsey's words, unpaid care work entails a systemic transfer of hidden subsidies to the rest of the economy that go unrecognized, imposing a systemic time tax on women throughout their life cycle. UBI could help fix this imbalance by ensuring that women who leave work or who cut back hours to care for family members have the security of an economic floor that they can't fall below. We forget that when the US welfare system was created, one of its stated goals was to allow mothers, and at the time it was only mothers, to stay at home with their young children. We have supported family care before as a society, and we could do so again. Another argument for UBI can be taken from the theological realm. Basic income would afford more people the time for the all-important human activity of leisure. Let me explain what I mean by that. In a casual way, we might think of leisure as rest and fun. I work hard all week, so when I come home, I just have to crash on the couch and binge watch on Netflix, and then I have the rest I need for my body and mind to get up and go to work again the next day. Understanding leisure as rest suggests that work is our true purpose in life, and leisure merely exists to support our working lives but the Catholic tradition sees leisure in a totally different way. Instead of work being the purpose of life, leisure, in fact, is the highest purpose of human life. The German philosopher Joseph Pieper believed that in leisure, we contemplate what is real, which means our own lives, God's creation, and the reality of the divine. He wrote, leisure is a form of stillness that is the necessary preparation for accepting reality. Only the person who is still can hear, and whoever is not still cannot hear. Leisure is the disposition of immersion in the real. In leisure, we open ourselves to the world and celebrate it. So the highest form of leisure is worshiping God, celebrating the real truth of divine love for us. Time spent with one's family, enjoying nature, engaged in social issues, or immersed in literature or art would also qualify. To allow ourselves to attend to and celebrate what is real takes time. Basic income could afford many workers the room in their budget and schedule to perform this most crucial act of human life, to spend time contemplating what is real. And finally, the most straightforward reason growing numbers of people support basic income is this. It helps people meet their basic needs. 
Basic income proponents want others to have access to the food, shelter, and other necessities of a dignified life. They can see that even people who work hard aren't always able to access these basic needs reliably because of low wages, precarious jobs, or just life events like unemployment, illness, or childcare. As Andrew Yang says, the reason people are in poverty is because they don't have money. If you want to end poverty, give people money. Basic income promises not just to end poverty, but also to promote mobility. A basic income would afford so many the freedom to provide family care, pursue higher education, or start a business, and ensure that those who are struggling have an economic floor they can't fall below. It's a practical, pro-human proposal. Does Catholic social thought support universal basic income? Catholic social thought, an important resource for ethicists, is a body of teaching on why and how to pursue justice in political, economic, and social life. In Catholic social thought, or CST, popes and bishops speak to all people who are concerned about just social structures. This tradition has consistently taught that every human being has the right to meaningfully access a fairly comprehensive list of basic needs, those things necessary for leading a meaningfully dignified human life. As listed by Pope John XXIII, those include food, clothing, shelter, medical care, rest, and the right to be looked after whenever through no fault of their own, workers are deprived of the means of livelihood. I want to stress that Catholic social thought insists on the right to attain these goods, to actually have and enjoy them, not simply to remain free to pursue them. We can see this in the way such rights are always discussed in a communal context. The right to attain these goods is coupled with the duty of each member of society to ensure those goods are meaningfully made available for people's use. And Catholic social thought is completely comfortable with a robust state helping to provide those basic goods. The Catholic tradition regards government as a positive force which represents all people of a society working together. The state is not something over above or over against individuals or individual families. It is their creation and it can legitimately work on their behalf to help people in need. So Catholic social thought promotes human dignity, wants all people to have access to the basic needs of a dignified life, and generally supports governments levying taxes and providing resources to help people achieve those basic needs. So it seems like it should be a slam dunk to say that Catholic social thought would support UBI. There's just one problem. Catholic social thought also insists that there's a duty to work. Now we saw that in many cases, basic income does not reduce participation in waged work, except if you're taking care of young kids or going to school. But we also saw that many basic income advocates are looking ahead to the automated future hoping UBI can help us create a society where machines do more work and people have more free time for other things. Can Catholic social thought get behind this vision for a highly automated society where UBI helps people survive? The answer can be found in a correct understanding of Catholic social thought's view of work. First, it's important that we understand what work is not for CST. In US society, we tend to say that the purpose of work is income. Work is valuable because it provides wages to allow the worker to support herself and hopefully her family. This perspective has many implications, not all of which Catholic social thought supports. For example, it leads us to believe that work that earns higher wages is more valuable. We imagine that financial managers contribute more to society than K-12 teachers. Retail workers share stories of being treated with disrespect that's explicitly linked to their low wages. And even if we sometimes wonder why athletes and actors are paid so well when all they do is chase a ball or play pretend, it's pretty widely accepted in our culture that higher wages mean your work is more worthwhile. However, Catholic social thought explicitly calls this view out as an error. Catholic social thought views work as an important human activity, not just because it provides people with means of survival, but because of work's impact on the one who does it. Rather than what we get out of work, Catholic social thought is interested in who we become when we work. At its best, work allows us to live out our human nature as creative, striving, and social beings, to develop our unique potential, and to emulate God. In the words of John Paul II, through work, the worker achieves fulfillment as a human being, and in a sense, becomes more a human being. When we work, we act out our human nature, which is profoundly social, creative, and in the image of God. We grow in ways that are uniquely human, Creativity, planning for the future, developing our talents, living out our values, relating to others, giving glory to God. That's Pope Francis's list. We interact with other human beings as God created us to do, and we act on the rest of creation, where God placed human beings in charge. 
As Pope Francis says, any activity involving a modification of existing reality, from producing a social report to the design of a technological development, is a form of work through which we interact with God's creation and develop ourselves who are God's creation too. So the purpose of work is not to take home a wage or keep ourselves busy, or even fundamentally to make ourselves useful for, to society, but it's really to be the type of creature God created us to be, a creative, active human being in relationship with others and with God's creation. To recap, it's very important to note that work as it's understood in the Catholic social tradition is not simply what we do for wages. Rather, work is any activity in which we act on the world around us, imitating the creator and even contributing to God's ongoing creative activity. Caring for children or the elderly, taking care of household chores, volunteering, making art, and building up social communities are all acts of work in the Catholic understanding. So this makes sense, right? These are all recognizably valuable human activities, whether or not you get paid for them. If someone is a cook who goes to work and cooks to make wages to take home to her family, and then she goes home and cooks dinner for her family, that exact same activity does not cease to be work now that she's no longer getting paid for it. It's the same creative activity. It uses her talents in the same way. It works on God's creation, the food, in the same way. So unpaid work is work. And the duty to work in Catholic social thought can be fulfilled through either paid or unpaid labor. This is clear in many aspects of the tradition. A significant piece of evidence that the tradition doesn't require paid work as a condition for access to basic goods is the way it treats subsistence farmers. Since the very earliest Catholic social thought documents, the tradition has acknowledged that here are a class of people who have plenty of work to do. They do not need access to work. What farmers may need is access to land. So the tradition asserts that it's the responsibility of society to ensure that those who have the ability and desire to farm have access to the land they need to do so. The way the tradition treats farming is a good example of its insistence that given the ability to do so, people will engage in useful work, which doesn't have to mean waged work. But there may be times that they need some assistance to be able to do this, and it's frequently society's responsibility to help them achieve this. Entrepreneurs are another class of workers who clearly honor their duty to work whether or not they are currently gaining an income. In fact, as Francis Hanafay shows, papal teaching on entrepreneurship does not cast it in terms of wages and income at all, but rather focuses precisely on the creative, personal development potential of entrepreneurial work. Artists whose creative labor is so often unpaid or underpaid are also highly respected by the tradition. In addition to farmers, entrepreneurs, and artists, family caregiving, which the vast majority of popes have assumed to be the primary work of women, is rightly praised as work in Catholic social teaching. It meets the basic theological description of work and that it's a quintessentially human activity through which we engage and enact our human nature, in this case, to creatively care. And it is not waged, and Catholic social thought has never claimed that it should be. Family care is certainly a way that much of humanity fulfills their duty to work regardless of the fact that this work is rarely performed for pay. So we can see that very many people are honoring their duty to work, despite the fact that they may not be currently working for pay. Since the Catholic tradition understands human beings as inherently good, creative, and social, to find people working to contribute in the way they feel God calls them to do should really come as no surprise. Many theologians like to assert that CST claims there's a duty to work to provide for one's basic needs. However, you rarely find them supporting this view with citations to papal texts. And I believe this is for the good reason that this position links two genuine assertions of CST in a way that the tradition does not. Are the right to basic needs and the duty to work two separate, unrelated things? Or does the one depend on the other? Does the right depend on the duty? If I were to try and sum up what the Catholic social thought tradition actually says, it would go something like this. Human beings are created by God as creative, striving, and interdependent. We all have a responsibility to exercise our creative, striving, active nature. To fail to do so would be to squander God's gift. This means each human being has a duty to work, to create, maintain, cultivate, or care for some aspect of God's creation. Such work, be it intellectual creation, physical labor, or caregiving for vulnerable humans, carries immense innate dignity precisely because it allows humans to exercise some of the various capabilities given to us by God. It is also true that the human being created by God is needy. 
We need food, shelter, health care, and the society of other human beings. No human ever created has been able to attain all these basic needs without the help of others, not even as an adult, and certainly not throughout the entire lifespan. We all depend on the work of others to achieve some part of our basic needs, both in vulnerable childhood and old age, and even when at the peak of adult health and ability. Since the human person is created by God as needy and must have these basic goods to survive, the church teaches that attaining these basic goods is a right, and a right that may place duties of response on other persons, even on entire societies. So note how the duty to work, meaning work in the broad sense, and the right to basic needs can be strongly asserted and connected to a theological view of the human person without ever insisting that the right rests on performance of the duty. This, I believe, is an accurate reflection of the view of Catholic social thought. Now let's be clear, CST absolutely could not subscribe to a basic income guarantee that forbid people to do waged or unwaged work. Not many people are proposing that, but just in case, we couldn't do it. Working for wages to support self and family is one of the basic rights Catholic social thought consistently defends. Humans have the right to attain basic needs and the right to engage in waged employment. Catholic social thought emphatically does not require that employment be the only way to achieve these basic needs nor does it rule out government provision as a way to achieve them. Indeed, it seems quite logical that basic income would free people's time for the many valuable forms of work that go beyond waged employment and that do so much to promote healthy families, strong communities, and vibrant local cultures. Maintaining homes, repairing vehicles and possessions, gardening, cooking, providing care, and making art are indisputably work. Paid or not, they are creative, sustaining activities through which we shape the world. Universal basic income can help people achieve basic needs and support the many important types of work, paid and unpaid, that people do to live out their human nature and honor their duty to work. And universal basic income offers a third promise that is most exciting from a theological perspective. It invites us to shift our thinking around the fundamental question of who deserves the basic goods they need to live and why. Given the data that suggests that universal basic income does not depress work for pay as much as is commonly feared, it might seem like I've spent an awful lot of time defending the idea that the duty to work is not a duty to paid work. In real world situations, many people who receive basic income still do paid work or look for paid work. But I'm trying to push us to accept the idea that we might design a society where someone who does no paid work, even someone who does no useful work at all, might get to live and not starve to death. And I argue we should accept and even embrace that possibility. Who is, who is this guy? Might have to ask some of my colleagues who are my age. Who is this guy? The dude. The dude from the movie The Big Lebowski. So when people resist the idea of basic income or any sort of social assistance to those in need, I think a lot of their resistance comes from thinking about people like this guy. The dude is someone with no visible means of support. He contributes little of value to society. He's not an artist or a pillar of the community. He basically hangs out with his friends, drinks a lot, engages in petty crime, and stuff like that. He's a, another character describes him as a bum. He's the kind of person who might say he's a perfectly nice guy, but he's basically pretty feckless. You know, we all know people like this. Maybe some of us are people like this. No judgment. <laughs> So I'm, I'm guessing it was fairly easy to convince you that there are groups of people within US society who do valuable work that isn't paid, who would fairly benefit from a basic income. Family caregivers, artists, community volunteers. But I wonder if any of you are thinking, OK, it's all well and good to help people like that get some type of support, some basic economic floor. But what about those in our society who just take their basic income and do absolutely nothing to contribute to the common good? What about people like the dude? Do we really want to be a society that provides aid to the feckless? And I think it's good and important that UBI invites us to envision becoming a society that provides a basic economic floor, yes, even to the feckless. To begin with, I would say the adult who truly contributes absolutely nothing to the common good is rare indeed. When you think of caregiving, making art, building community, the average person, as we've seen, contributes in numerous ways. British journalist Kirsty Major observed how much value social media users contribute to those fabulously wealthy companies just by sharing our own content. She wrote, 
baby photos, birthday party invites, and self-indulgent status updates are the coal, iron, and steel of the fourth industrial revolution. And she says a basic income is more than warranted, given how much valuable content ordinary social media users create daily. That's a pretty formidable argument. But still I want to argue that it's good, in fact crucial, that UBI helps us see that even the feckless deserve meaningful access to basic needs. Because it helps us recognize the truth that all human beings are vulnerable and need each other, even we, who as we all like to think, contribute so much. Given the widespread disdain for programs of social assistance today, it appears that many in our society just don't think that everyone deserves access to basic needs simply in light of their humanity. In light of Catholic social thought, it should be clear by now, this is a serious error. Our right to basic needs stems from our vulnerable social human nature, not from our performance of the duty to work. In Catholic understanding, needing help from others to survive and thrive is not a sign of diminished dignity but a universal feature of the human condition. That said, there's an even more fundamental reason why Christian theology demands we find ways to provide aid without stigma, without even the suspicion of a question of who is deserving. And that is simply this. While we are still sinners, Christ died for us. The central mystery of Christianity is an offer of help to human beings who don't, indeed who never could, deserve it. How better can we imitate God's generous love than by finding practical, achievable ways to offer help to those who need it? Not only by serving those whom we think deserve it, but striving to love all those in need as generously and unstintingly as God loves us. This Christian way of thinking about the economy is described by Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI as the logic of gift. Rooted in our own awareness of God's profound gifts to us, the logic of gift replaces profit-minded market logic with an ethic of reciprocity. As theologian David Cloutier explains, reciprocity involves doing or giving something with an open-ended and unenforceable expectation of some future response, either to the self or to some other party. The reciprocal exchange need not be a matter of value equivalence, for it begins in someone's desire to make a gift, not to make a deal. Um, this was written before 2016, but I just had to get that quote in there. Pope Benedict says, as I've tried to show in this talk, that both religious response to God's intent for us and simple analysis of the economic situation demand an economic system shaped by the logic of gift. In his words, the principle of gratuitousness and the logic of gift as an expression of fraternity can and must take their place within normal economic activity. Some of us who are comfortable for our own thinking applying Christian theological concepts to the economy might wonder how, they, how effective they can really be in public conversations in a pluralist society. I believe Christian thought does have something unique and important to bring to conversations about public aid. But if you don't want to take my word for it, because I am obviously biased, you could pick up Cut Loose, a book by sociologist Victor Tan Chen in Ethnography of Unemployed Workers. Chen shows that many US people subscribe to what he calls meritocratic morality, which presumes that success or failure reflects individual worth and effort, and that if you're not doing well, you don't deserve others' help. In its place, Chen calls for what he terms a morality of grace, characterized by radical acceptance and an ethos of compassion and sacrifice. As Chen describes it, grace morality offers a compassionate perspective, offering help to the undeserving. But grace rejects the categories of right and wrong. It is, in fact, antithetical to justice in that it offers neither retribution nor restitution, but forgiveness. Redemption is not based on deservingness. It is available to all. I find it quite remarkable that when Chen, a self-described agnostic, needed a concept to describe the world he wanted to see, to describe a moral orientation that assumes people deserve help simply by virtue of the fact that they need it, the term he landed on was a central tenet of Christian doctrine, grace. And in my view, he absolutely nails it. Christians believe and proclaim that God offers grace to those who don't deserve it. Indeed, there's nothing humans could do to deserve the freely given, abundant love God offers us. So I believe that if we are to attempt to love one another as God loves us, the first step is to change our minds and banish our ideas that others have to deserve our help before we give it. Universal basic income offers us a tool to help change our minds. We started by confronting the immense impact technology is having and will have in the future on the shape of paid human work. 
Born of the Industrial Revolution, Catholic social thought has always dealt with the impact of automation on human work, but it has yet to adequately respond to the coming impact of mechanization on the contemporary landscape. Not till Laudato Si in 2015, Pope Francis's environmental encyclical, do we see even an acknowledgement that mechanization and machine learning are displacing human jobs. And still the proposed solution is a bit circular, as recent Catholic social thought still insists that the solution is helping people find jobs. By sticking with this solution, the framers of Catholic social thought not only grossly underrate the present and coming impact of automation on human labor, they also neglect the radical and elegant solution clearly written within their own tradition. Catholic social thought clearly teaches that waged work is not the only permissible path to obtaining life's necessities. Government provision is a dignified way to meet basic needs. And our faith in active, creative human nature asserts that people will fulfill their duty to work in a thousand creative, caring ways, even if the work is not done for pay. Theologian James Kakamo pointed out that until Laudato Si, recent Catholic social thought framed technology as a gift from God and as a neutral force for humans to use for either good or bad. And these are both views that Kakamo finds rather naive. In contrast, Pope Francis notes that technology, while dependent on our God-given creativity, is a human creation subject to human sin. Technologies are not neutral, since they're shaped by human choices and condition humans in turn. Decisions which may seem purely instrumental, Francis says, are in reality decisions about the kind of society we want to build. With universal basic income, we can choose to build a society where technology provides its many benefits to humanity, and people continue to engage in dignified work and achieve the basic needs of life. Doing so will require us to leave behind our conviction that a dignified life must depend on wage labor. We can learn from the Catholic social tradition that our right to basic needs flows forth from our human nature, not from our participation in waged work. As creative, relational, God-inspired creatures, humans will continue to perform the many irreplaceable forms of work that currently fit into the hours between wage, labor, and sleep. Why shouldn't we do so with the security of a basic income for a social safety net? Basic income offers immense potential to address serious inequalities in our economy from low wages, to the undervaluing of care work, to the paucity of time for true leisure, to the profound impact robots will make on human ability to secure dignified nature, labor, dignified labor. I also look at it as a theological teaching tool. Basic income invites us to realize the universal truth that all humans, even the feckless, deserve to have their basic needs met. And it offers us a practical way to get there. Thank you. <laughs>